first of all, let's define what we're talking about. The motion before us says this house would legalise assisted dying. It does not say this house would legalise euthanasia only. Assisted dying is being campaigned for by people like Dignity and Dying as physician assisted suicide. The proponents here are talking about physician administered euthanasia. Can we have some honesty and some clarity to make laws you have to know what you're talking about, you have to be honest and clear, and the laws must be practical and you must be able to implement them in the real world of complex human relationships in which we live. And those meant to implement this law are opposed to it. The BMA reaffirmed the opposition of doctors to being involved and in 2010, the Royal College of Physicians, in evidence to the Director of Public Prosecutions, said that a doctor's duty of care, and I quote, does not include being in any way part of their suicide. And why? Because compassion demands us, as doctors, to respect the intrinsic worth of everyone in front of us, no matter how disabled, how ill, how frail, how vulnerable they are. We must respect the intrinsic worth of that person and redouble our efforts and make sure that they are not subjected to inhumane or futile treatments, but that they are respected as a person. Why does it matter what doctors think in any kind of safeguard programme? Safeguards have already been spoken about. A vital ingredient is assessing a person's state of mind. You need to know the person, you need to know what makes them vulnerable to unseen pressures, and you need to know their liability to depression and to feeling completely hopeless. Some of you in this chamber will have already suffered from depression. Some of you will have come out of it already, but when you're in the depth of black despair, you see no hope and your desire for death may well be there. But we have, su no, we have suicide prevention policies in this country. With most doctors not willing to participate, what would happen? A few will not be uncomfortable with supplying lethal drugs to, and with doing the assessments, but they will not know the person in front of them and they will be reliant on what is written in the case notes. And we know perfectly well from all the medical legal cases that case notes can be notoriously inaccurate in the way they portray somebody. Today, even when you're on a GP's list, your doctor may not know you well. And actually, we know that fair care has sadly become more fragmented. One study of palliative care patients, patients facing death in the last year of life, found that they saw on average 28 doctors. One patient in six months saw 31. That is not continuity of care, that is fragmented care. You do not want people assessing life and death decisions who don't even know the patients properly. Now may I turn to autonomy? Much has been made of it. For any of you here to make an autonomous decision, there are three things you need, whether it's buying a car, getting married or taking your life. You need information. You need to know that you have the capacity to make a decision and you need to make it voluntarily, without pressure. Let me deal with each of those. Information, you depend on the doctor for information. But I'm sorry, medicine is an inexact science. We know that about one in 20 people die and at post-mortem are found to have died from something they weren't being treated for. And actually, prognosis is notoriously inaccurate. Mike Richards, the cancer czar, described it as fraught with difficulty. Phrases like three months, six months, they're nothing more than guesswork. The Royal College of General Practitioners, in evidence to the select, select committee on which I sat, said, it is possible, and I quote, to make reasonably accurate prognoses of death <laughs> within minutes, hours, or a few days. But when that stretches to months, then the scope for error can extend into years. And I've seen it at first hand. I'm a working doctor. I've looked after thousands and thousands of dying patients. In 1991, a young man with a young family was referred to me. He had been told by three senior independent doctors his prognosis was three months or less. 
On that decision, he, on that he made his decision, he was desperate for euthanasia, absolutely desperate. 21 years later, he is still alive. But 11 years ago, his wife died suddenly, and he has brought up the three children alone. They would have gone into care if his wish had been acceded to. Now, what about Oregon's law, where they've enshrined this? Six months is a requirement before lethal drugs can be supplied. Official records show that actually it can go on for much longer. Some patients have had their drugs for many months, one for nearly three years before taking them. So even where they try to define terminal illness in law, it doesn't work. Yet prognosis is often put forward as a safeguard and a plank in proposals. Secondly, let me turn to capacity, your mental capacity to take your decision, your autonomous decision, and how will that be assessed? Well, we know that hopelessness and depression can influence the desire for death. A study from Oregon which followed patients who had passed all their safeguards and was published in the BMJ in 2008 found that one in six of the people who'd gone through and had taken their life actually had an untreated clinical depression. It had been missed. And drugs, steroids, other drugs patients are on, disease itself alters mental capacity. So mental capacity is complex. Most doctors aren't well trained to assess it anyway, and you cannot assess it on a single point. You need time. But what about voluntariness? Let me turn to that. That's very difficult. Subtle pressures are extremely difficult to assess particularly in families. I had a patient in her 50s dying. Her loving family were very worried about her, visited all the time, and then the visits got less. She told the, one of the nurses the reason was on her birthday, her fixed-term life insurance policy had expired. They lost out financially, and their loving care seemed to diminish quite rapidly. I'm afraid family dynamics are complex, and I can't assess them, and other doctors can't. There is also the influence of the doctor themselves, the nuances, the way that they give information, whether they feel that the patient in front of them is becoming a bore and a burden and a heart sink patient, whether they're actually finding them too difficult, whether that doctor is too proud to seek help from somebody else. People trust their doctors because they have to. All over the world, whether the law's changed or not, they trust them. Just as when I get on a plane, I trust the pilot because I have to, I can't fly a plane. The doctor-patient relationship is highly asymmetric and it depends on communication. The patient picks up all of the little nuances. I've had many patients who've said to me, I want to end it all or I should end it all. But almost invariably, they are asking for reassurance that their future is not as they envisage, that problems that arise will be dealt with and they're actually saying that they desperately want support to live and start living again, not that they want me to kill them. It is not pain problems, make no mistake, it is not pain problems that make people think that they don't want to carry on living. I have seen people for whom I felt I could do nothing. They were the parents whose only child had been murdered and their living existence was nothing to do with the disease but yes, they were continually in despair. I don't know whether they fall inside your safeguards or not, but they certainly could commit suicide. There may be a small number of people who remain strong in their desire to end their lives, but I'm saying this is too dangerous. The safeguards are like tissue paper. They provide a false reassurance and doctors need to carry on providing care for patients. We don't now take the Hippocratic Oath per se, but our duty to patients is underpinned by a phrase in the Hippocratic Oath, which I will now quote to you. I will neither prescribe nor administer a lethal dose of medicine to any patient, even if asked, nor counsel any such thing. As a doctor, I am glad that I have to go back. I have to redouble efforts for my patients. I have to do all I can to restore quality of life. And I have to go back time and time again 
and not give in to what might seem like an easy quick fix option. It is too dangerous. I beg you, do not be seduced down this road.